You need to go to him. It was 11 p.m. I was lying in bed and this intrusive thought would not leave me alone. You need to take the van and go now. Step out in faith and go. Is this the voice of God? I wondered. Is this what God wants me to do? If it is, I'll do it. I'm willing to take risks if that's what God wants me to do, and I'm sure he'll protect me. I pulled out my phone and calculated the distance between Yellowknife and Toronto. It was over 3,000 miles in at least 48 hours of driving. I had gotten my driver's license about six weeks earlier. I was a late bloomer when it came to getting behind the wheel. I'd never even driven on a highway, and yet there was this deep feeling in my gut demanding that I pack up that night and start driving. It took all my willpower to ignore the impulse and go back to sleep. The next day, I told Levingston what I thought God might be asking me to do. He did not mince his words when he told me, that is not the voice of God. How do you know? I asked. It feels really strong. It feels like something I have to do. God would not ask you to take such a dangerous risk, he said. I thought through the Bible stories for a moment and said, it seems like God asks a lot of people to take big risks. Moses' mother risked everything to disobey the law by putting Moses in a basket. Mary risked her entire life by agreeing to be the mother of Jesus. And David definitely risked his life when he offered to fight Goliath. Yeah, but this isn't like that, he said. Those examples weren't motivated by fear. They were motivated by love. I'm motivated by love, I said. I want to come see you because I love you. I'll take the risk for love. You've never driven on a highway. What would you do if you got a flat tire? What if you got lost or something happened to you? I let the phone go quiet for a moment and declared, God will protect me. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Forever Love Podcast. My name is Lily and I'll be your host. So when Lovingston told me that it was not the voice of God telling me to get into the van and drive 3,000 miles to Toronto, he didn't understand the truth he was telling me that day. That in the Bible, people who took those big risks were fueled by love. What I felt that night was not motivated by love. It was completely motivated by fear. It was demanding, scary, and full of threats. And this is not the way God talks to his children. That's why it's so important for us to understand what exactly is fueling our actions. When anxiety, fear, resentment, and other similar negative emotions are driving our actions, the results are going to be destructive and sometimes deadly. But when our actions are fueled by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the results are life-giving, good for you, and bring glory to God. In today's episode, I want to share with you how you can begin to cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit on purpose. In the previous episode, I talked about the power of the life code and how our thoughts create our feelings. If you haven't listened to that one yet, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it first because this episode won't make much sense without it. When you understand the importance of your emotions, you can begin to see why it's so essential that we learn to cultivate good fuel on purpose instead of allowing our emotions to remain reactive. I don't know about you, but no one told me that I could choose my emotions. They told me to change my attitude and try to be happy or at least act like it so I don't bring everybody else down. But I never understood how to actually change my feelings. I thought, this is just the way I feel. There's nothing I can do about it. The problem that I ran into was believing that all of my observations were facts. For years, I did not realize that the thought, I had a terribly abusive childhood, was an optional thought. In my mind, it was just an indisputable fact. I also assumed a lot of other observations about my life and circumstances were facts as well, like, You can't trust men, or people will use you, or life is hard, or no one cares. All of these thoughts felt extremely true to me. For a long time, they were the framework in which I lived. 
I also had some very optimistic beliefs, but they never seemed to hold any water against the more sinister observations I saw as reality. So let's talk for a moment about what's fueling you. In an average day, what are your default emotions? Are you generally feeling tired, frustrated, discouraged, or annoyed? If so, I want you to begin to see that it's not your circumstances that are exasperating your zeal for life. It's your thoughts. Once you begin to recognize the emotions you're experiencing, you can begin to work your way backwards and discover the thoughts that are creating them. Some of those thoughts might sound like, nothing ever works out for me. This is taking too long. There's not enough time. I'm tired of being here. When we start to recognize that these are all just thoughts and not facts, we can begin to surrender them to Christ. In exchange, we can begin to adopt the mind of Christ by choosing to believe the truth that will set us free. In order to know whether or not something you're thinking is true, there are three questions I like to ask. The first is, is this true? You might be believing something that is just an observation or an idea that you came up with and there's no real truth to it, even though you think it's true. For example, you might think, nobody likes me. You found lots of evidence for it growing up. You've had a hard time making friends. You don't get dates easily. No one seems to be interested in you. And so you've come to the conclusion, nobody likes me. But is it true? When you step back and ask this question, you might realize it's not entirely accurate. Your mom likes you. Some of the ladies at work like you. God definitely likes you. So when we see that, we can begin to disprove our thoughts and recognize them for what they truly are. Thoughts that are optional. The second question is, would God agree with me? So if we stick with our assumption of nobody likes me, and we take that back to God and we try to get a heavenly perspective on it, we very quickly see that it is definitely not true. God would not agree with you that nobody likes you. First of all, he likes you. Second of all, he's aware of all the other people on earth who like you. The third question is, what would my life look like if I surrendered this thought to Christ? Now, this is a really powerful question that I want you to ask yourself. If you were to surrender the thought that nobody likes me, how would that change your life? If you decided, I'm not going to think that thought and believe it anymore, how would your life begin to change? What would be different? What if you decided to believe the opposite? Everybody likes me. The thought everybody likes me is no more true or false than the thought nobody likes me. And yet we can quickly see how this shift in your thought process would completely change your life. If you went out and surrendered the thought nobody likes me and picked up the truth of God instead and said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am loved by the most high God. Your life would begin to change. And so I want to ask you. What's fueling you? Because the consequences of being fueled by fear, anxiety, doubt, and dread are real. And that's why I want to talk about how we can cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit instead. Now, the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What would your life look like if this was the fuel that was driving you in everything you do? We can plug these emotions into the life code in the emotion line. And I believe that it is important to begin at the top of the list with love because this is the most powerful emotion we have access to. Love is so powerful. This entire universe, all of creation was created through the power of love in Christ. So we want to begin there because from what I've experienced, each fruit of the spirit unlocks the next one. So love unlocks joy. You can't really experience joy unless you have love in your life. And peace is unlocked by the presence of love and joy and so forth. 
And this explains why it's so hard to develop self-control without self-love. Because if you jump to the bottom of the line and try really hard to cultivate the emotion of self-control without any love, what we end up doing is beating ourselves up over and over and over again. And we get into these spirals of shame. And when we're in that spiral of shame, it is so difficult to come back to the Father and embrace his love for us. But that is the only way we can really make progress and overcome sin and temptation in our lives. So when you put an emotion like love into your life code, I want you to ask yourself, what would I need to be thinking in order to feel this way? Most of us tend to assume that we will feel loved in the future when our circumstances change. I'll feel loved once I'm married. I'll feel loved once I fall in love with somebody. But that's not true. We actually need to feel loved ahead of time in order to create the outcome we're looking for, in order to create our God-given desire for a Christ-centered marriage, we need to fuel that desire with love not wait for it to be a byproduct of achieving our God-given desire. One way to do this is to go to your past and reflect on the times in which you did experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you felt joy? When was the last time you felt that peace or that gentleness? I want you to reflect on that and then ask yourself, what was I thinking that created that emotion for me? And what did I do when I was feeling that way? I'm going to guess that the way you act when you are filled with those emotions of goodness, love, peace, patience are much more in alignment with who you imagine yourself to be in Christ than when you're feeling shame, doubt, and anxiety. That is why it is so important that we take this up as a spiritual discipline, learning to discipline our minds rather than letting our minds manage us and telling us what to think. Your brain is a beautiful gift from God. It is the most powerful computer in the universe. And yet, if we let it go on its default settings, it is always going to default towards survival mode to keep you alive. But I want to encourage you to set your settings a little higher. Choose to thrive by engaging your mind in the process of cultivating emotions intentionally, not letting them happen by default. And of course, you're still going to experience all the human emotions, and that's totally normal. That's part of being human. As long as you're human, you are going to continue to experience the full range of emotions. We know this because Christ himself experienced the full range of human emotions. Notice that when he grieved for the loss of his friend, Lazarus, he knew the truth that he would rise again, and yet he chose to in that moment, feel grief. Because as humans, we don't want to be happy all the time. We're not here to be happy all the time. We are here to have a very human experience, which includes a wide range of emotions. That's why there are no good emotions and bad emotions when we are intentional about them and we know that they're optional. But when we feel like we're at the mercy of them, That's when we feel like a victim, we feel like life is happening to us, and we have a very hard time embracing the truth that all things are working for my good. Now, in the next episode, I'm going to share with you one of my darkest hours. I'm going to talk about how I let my negative emotions really lead me into some bad decision making and how I use that as a turning point in my life. Thank you so much for listening. This has been another episode of Forever Love with Lily Matanguiza. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next episode. This episode is sponsored by my free Relationship Starter Course. Discover the first step to an equally yoked, Christ-centered relationship. In this free course, you're going to learn who you are in Christ, 
what your core values are, and how to attract an equally yoked partner. Your marriage matters, and I believe that the best time to prepare for it is now, while you're single. That's why I created this brand new three-part mini training series to teach single women how to love themselves deeply and authentically for who they are in Christ so that they can establish healthy Christ-centered relationships. When you know who you are, and more importantly, whose you are, you'll never settle for less than God's best. Go to Proverbs2426.com slash start. That's Proverbs 2426.com slash start and begin today. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, I want to encourage you to subscribe so that you don't miss any of the tools, wisdom, and stories that will support you on your journey towards forever love. This has been another episode of the Forever Love Podcast with Lily Matanguiza. Thanks for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you again soon.